Opioids. It's an epidemic that's killing America. We'll explore why and meet somebody who's been personally affected on this episode of The Hot Zone. This is The Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hi, folks. I'm Chuck Holton. Nearly 800,000 Americans have died from drug overdoses since 1999, just in the United States. Last year, that level was six times higher than it was in 99, and more than 130 people are dying from drugs every day. It started out with prescription pills back in the 90s, and then moved to heroin in the 2000s, and lately, the amount of synthetic drugs like fentanyl is killing more people than ever. It's a nationwide epidemic that's affecting more than 2 million Americans a year. Now, the demand for these drugs is a boon for narco-traffickers. They're shipping more fentanyl and heroin into the United States now than ever before. And they're taking advantage of the chaos on the U.S. southern border to drive convoys full of this poison into our country every day. Last year alone, U.S. Customs and Border Protection seized enough fentanyl to kill the entire population of the United States. And that's just the stuff they caught. The economic impact of this crisis is north of $500 billion a year. That's enough to build the border wall 30 times over. So this is much more than a national security crisis, and it's more than a law enforcement issue. It's a cultural crisis that's rotting America from the inside out. Southern West Virginia is one of the hardest hit areas of the country, and I've done a good bit of reporting on that over the years since I've got a home in Southern West Virginia. And I'm going to show you some of that reporting today because it's every bit as relevant now as it was five years ago. Only now the problem's even much more pervasive and that much more urgent. You know, everywhere you look here in Southern West Virginia, you see remnants of a bygone era. This soda fountain was here since 1912. Back then, this was a very thriving community with strong religious faith, strong work ethic, and full employment. But as the jobs went away and were replaced by government entitlement programs, the culture started to crumble. And while it still might look the same on the outside, this is a place that will never be the same again. I can show you where my brother personally died from a drug overdose. And a month later, there was a lady murdered. She was stabbed 14 times. Your brother died right here? Yes, on the other side of the building. That's correct. Boone County in southern West Virginia has one of the highest rates of overdose deaths from prescription drugs of any county in West Virginia. And the West Virginia State Police are doing everything they can to put a stop to it breaking and enterings and just about every crime that we're seeing is related to drugs in some form or fashion. Fatal drug overdoses involving uh, prescription drugs uh, is the number one cause of death. It outranks uh, automobile fatalities here. We have people who start abusing pills when they're as young as 11, 12 years old. Uh, We see families torn apart. There's really nothing for kids to do out here. So we always went up in the mountains somewhere and uh, 14 and 15 were drinking, sitting around a fire, so what was the next step when you hit 18? You know, you everybody was tired of that. I mean, every single day, no matter where you stop here, you see some kind of drug deal. It's all around you. It's all you know, it's all you see. A lot of the people I deal with are being raised by their grandparents or great-grandparents uh, because either their m- mommies and daddies don't care because they're always high, or in a lot of cases where mommy and daddies are dead because of drug overdoses. It's the drug that you have the most readily available that is going to come into the hands to where people experiment with. And that's one of the things that you see in the high schools is people go to mom and dad's medicine cabinet and get some and they take it. You know, both my parents sold, they dealt, they, you know, they did. Mm-hmm. And of course back then, it was out right there in front of us. I have three daughters I'm raising here and I don't want them to have to Um, fight the same battles that other kids are fighting today to stay away from the dangerous drugs and the crime that's going on with the drugs that are here today. Tackling the problem is a real challenge for law enforcement in these areas, partially because legitimate institutions are supplying most of the drugs, and because unlike cocaine or heroin, pills are legal to own, carry, and use as long as one has a prescription. 
Went to the doctor, got prescribed pain pills. Took it from there, got addicted to pain pills, went to harder stuff, and, you know, sooner or later, you lose everything and you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. We have to uh, decide, are the people really having um, legitimate pain or are they here just to get medications? We'd been working a case on this gentleman. Uh, we were buying pills off individuals, you know, Ziploc bags, uh, large quantities from people in the community. And once we started investigating the where the source of supply, they led us to a doctor's office that was uh, practicing here. He was a top five prescriber at the time, I believe, in the state of West Virginia. Small rural clinics sometimes contribute to this problem, willingly or unwillingly. We're watching an undercover video to go into his office and to basically see what is going on inside his office and see what this, his standard of practice is. Doctors have been arrested for running what are known as pill mills, where drug users can purchase prescriptions without having to demonstrate a legitimate need. I've been trying to get a driver's license. This is the CI walking into the doctor's office. What this girl's doing is documenting on a calendar and a chart of when she gave them the scripts and when her next visit's gonna be. The girl there has a cash register where she just gave her back some change. She actually paid for her husband's office visit and her office visit just for walking in. And then she ended up with a total, I think it was over 500 hydrocodone tablets and a couple hundred uh, Valium, Valium tablets. So then you have them to use or to sell. Certain areas of the countries don't have the same prescription pill problem we have here. An example of that would be the Detroit area or the Columbus area. So what we're seeing, we're seeing the pill pushers buy the drugs up there and you know, relatively cheap prices as compared to West Virginia. Bring them down here, uh, sell them, uh, make the extra money, and then take that money back north with them. You know, I've, I've spoken to several people down here that, uh, you know, they'll tell you that they, they make pretty decent living off of uh, just selling pills. On some conditions or some buys, we've paid as much as $160 for one tablet. And it's, uh, you know, it's crazy the amount of money. So a guy gets hurt in the, in the coal mine and he gets a, a prescription for one of these. And he he can sell this on the street. That's hundred pills. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> that's that's eight thousand yeah. dollars right there. I mean, around here, that's six months' income. Mm -hmm. your, your drug addict that's on drugs usually is not doesn't have money, so they're going to break into houses to try to either steal drugs um, or to steal items to trade for money um, to get drugs, pawn shop, take money, or uh, take stolen items to pawn shops. For somebody that's just surviving, they'll do whatever it takes. They'll take whatever they can, they'll steal, they'll do whatever it takes to, to survive. The people that we encounter that are hurting themselves can also be hurting other people, whether they're they're breaking in homes, uh, stealing from people, um, driving down the road while they're high on these pills. Um, they do hurt other people. Here in southern West Virginia, it's easy to see, even in the dead of winter, that this place has a lot to offer in the way of beauty and natural resources. But for the citizens who live here and the police who are fighting these battles against prescription drug abuse, this is truly a front lines. I just want to stop and encourage you to go watch more of the Frontlines episodes that we made over the last six years. It's really well produced, and the NRA doesn't get enough credit for how much it tries to make America safer, even when it doesn't have to do with guns, just by getting the word out with shows like Frontlines. Same with this podcast. Please share it with your friends. If you, if you go and subscribe over at patreon.com slash hotzone, you're going to get access to a bunch of special features, like free copies of my books and access to some of the paid content I've produced on church security and a whole lot more. All right. So last year, I went and interviewed my friend Leon Brush. He's got some real skin in this game and is working really hard to drag addicts out of that life in Southern West Virginia and give them some hope. Take a look. Here in the southern part of West Virginia, it's uh, actually been, I think th this county had the most overdose deaths uh, of any county in the country. Is that right? This is Leon Brush. And uh, I would just tell us a little bit about yourself, Leon. I'm Leon Brush here in southern West Virginia, where we have the number one deaths due to drug overdoses in the nation. If you had a target on the United States, the target would be right here in Beckley. And uh, you have some personal uh, experience with this, right? Yes. My s wife and I lost our, our third son, Brian, to a drug overdose, uh, and it totally changed the way we look at 
the opioid crisis. That was about 10 years ago, right? That was about 10 years ago, and it was life-changing. Yeah, it was. It was life-changing for a lot of people because you, it, it, Leon took that pain and used it to do something good. So he's started a, a halfway house or kind of a safe house for recovering drug addicts here in southern West Virginia. And tell me a little bit about the, the numbers of what you, you, who, who you've been able to help since you've, you started this. Well, we've helped hundreds and probably thousands by now, families, uh, since we opened the doors uh, of Brian's safe house. And last year, we actually opened it up to the women uh, in the southern West Virginia area. And what a surprise, there is just as much addiction among women as there was also with men. And that totally uh, has been eye-opening to see how pervasive the problem is. So, Grant, uh, here in southern West Virginia, when a guy gets picked up for, uh, you know, carrying drugs or selling drugs and is an addict, sometimes the judge will give him a choice of uh, going to jail or going to the safe house. Is that correct? Yes. We often work with the legal system, and instead of sending them to prison where they learn more <laughs> evil ways, uh, they have the opportunity to come to Brian's safe house and actually learn how to live without drugs. And they've done a great job uh, with that. And uh, full, full disclosure, we're, we're supporters of this, uh, this safe house. And uh, I can tell you, there's no better place that I feel, uh, uh, that nothing that makes me feel better about the money that we give to charity, yeah, for sure. I, I, absolutely. Leon, can I ask you, because I've covered this epidemic for many years as well, um, can you tell me about your son? My guess is you've got pictures of him as a, as a small child acting like every other kid. This could have been any one of our uh, sons or daughters that went through this. Can you tell me about him and how he ends up in a position? And, and the reason I ask you is I want other parents out there to get the message that this could be their kid very easily. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it could be any family that could be uh, blighted by this uh, terrible uh, crisis. But for our family, uh, I was a business owner here in southern West Virginia, a floor covering business, and was a church attending family. Uh, our son Brian went to church every Sunday and Wednesday night, was in the youth group, went to a Christian school, served on, I served on the school board there. Uh, we were your all-American, God-following, Bible-toting, gun-toting, just regular people in southern West Virginia. And then uh, the Saturday that my own son came to me and he said, Dad, he was, 20, uh, three, he was 20 years old when he first told me this. He said, Dad, I'm an addict and I don't know what to do. And that changed my life forever. And for three years, we tried to help Brian find his way. You know, how it did came he... about because he had an, uh, a back injury, right? Is that right? He had a back injury or, or and he no. broke up with a girlfriend. Yeah, right? He had a girlfriend and she was going away to college and said, I don't want to have a permanent relationship uh, when I'm going away to college. I would like to have the freedom, and Brian couldn't handle it. So he went to his friend's house, and they said, let me show you a way to get away from the pain. Mm -hmm. You know, and when that was the beginning of his opioid addiction. The sad part for every parent, and I have an eight-year-old at home, so he's not quite at, at this level, but still you send them off into the world. You send them to school. You send them to play dates at, at kids' houses. You have no control over what goes on then. And uh, it's imperative that you stay involved, but sometimes no matter what you do, uh, you, you, you can't help what happens. What's your advice to parents to make sure this doesn't happen to their child, Leon? Well, step one is to watch the cell phone. The cell phone is probably the, the, probably the most uh, common instrument that's used in by the young people, and it all starts out most of the time pretty innocent. They don't really understand what they're getting into. The peer pressure, the cell phone is probably the biggest uh, hidden factor. Yeah. Chuck, can I ask you, uh, on the side of, of, of this epidemic, we talk about uh, the opioid crisis, we talk about the borders and drugs getting in, but typically these are prescription drugs getting in the hands of, of these youngsters. How are they getting their hands on these drugs? 
Well, you know, in, in this part of the world, uh, Grant, the, it's a coal mining country. A lot of coal miners, uh, actually, it's almost just embedded in the culture that, hey, you're going to get injured at some point and you're going to get uh, some time off to, to recover from your injury. You go and you get a, uh, a prescription for, for the pain, whether it's a, you know, torn meniscus or broken whatever. And uh, the, those pills are worth about 80 bucks a piece on the street. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got a six-month supply of those pills, you can dramatically increase your income by selling them. And uh, you yourself can just take uh, Tylenol or something for the pain. And as long as you can milk that out, you can keep making money. And that, again, it's just embedded in the culture here in southern West Virginia. And so we have friends of mine that are in law enforcement, they'll say that they very rarely find large amounts of other uh, illegal narcotics like uh, 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 marijuana or cocaine or things like that, not like you see down toward the border because it's just so easy to get the prescription medications here. And they've also had uh, doctors that, uh, are, you know, they call them pill mills that just, uh, they they are known as the doctor you go to if you want to get yourself a nice fat uh, 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 prescription for uh, oxycodone or whatever. But uh, as we've seen in, in this part of the world, the dev devastation that that causes is absolutely unspeakable. It's, it's really incredible how many people there are very few families that have not been touched by this crisis you, you know well that's all the time we've got for today folks i'm down in the jungles of panama as you watch this and i'll be bringing you some amazing content out of there later this week that has to do with the immigration crisis so stick around please like and share the podcast with your friends it really helps us and as we close in on our 100th episode this friday you're not going to want to miss that one it'll be a great episode for sure so thanks for being part of the hot zone i'm chuck holt the Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.